Well, good morning, beloved. I hope that you have had a good week. I know that it's been pretty chilly and, and windy. I don't really like the wind so much, but praise the Lord that it is May and it will be summer before we know it. Our scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Amos, chapter 4, verse 30. So, if you would turn with me in your Bibles today. Amos, chapter 4, verse 13. Amos 4, verse 13. And this is just a wonderful text. For lo, he that formeth the mountains, and createth the wind, and declareth unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high places of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. What a powerful verse that that is. Now before we begin, I'm going to ask the Lord to be with us in our study. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that you are King of kings and Lord of lords and that you rule it in the hearts of men. Oh, Father, I ask thee for people to tune in to this video, to find it and listen to it, open up their Bibles and study it and see if these things are so. Oh, Father, I ask help in this presentation. I humble myself before thee and please forgive me for my sins. And please prepare each and every one of us for thy soon second coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before we begin, I would just like to encourage each and every one of you to go ahead and get your Bibles. And so if you are at your home watching this, just go ahead and push pause and get your Bibles. And also, if you have a notebook, because you might want to take some notes. So go ahead and do that. It was the year 603 B.C. The great king Nebuchadnezzar was stirring in his bed. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was deeply perplexed. That night before he fell asleep, he was considering the kingdom of Babylon. No doubt he was thinking all about his military success and all the riches and the plunders and the spoils of war that he had obtained. But his heart was looking to the future. He was thinking about things. What's going to be happening after I'm gone? How long would this golden era last? So finally, he fell asleep. And as he slept, he dreamed a dream. Now this dream was not like the ordinary dreams that you and I have from time to time. This was a dream from the God of heaven, and it would have great import to him and the future succeeding generations all the way up to our time. <clears throat> our subject this morning is the image and the stone. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2, Verses 1 and 2. Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This great book of Daniel. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep broke from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, and the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. So the, the, the king Nebuchadnezzar told these men that he had dreamed a dream, and he wanted them to understand that his mind was troubled over this matter, and he wanted the interpretation. Now these Babylonian soothsayers said, tell us the dream and then we'll tell you the interpretation. But there was a problem. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar could not remember the particulars about this dream. 
And so he was wanting them to tell him what his dream was. Now dissatisfied with their evasive answer and suspicious because despite their pretentious claims to reveal the secrets of men, they nevertheless seemed unwilling to grant him help. The king commanded his wise men with promises of wealth and honor on the one hand and threats of death on the other to tell him not only the interpretation of the dream, but the dream itself. The thing is gone from me, he said. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you should be cut in pieces and your houses should be made a dunghill. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards of great honor. <clears throat> Isn't that interesting? He's willing to give them gifts and great honor. But if they will not or cannot answer his request, <clears throat> that they will be put to death. Well, just think about that. They are in a hard place. Verse 7. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation thereof. At that point, that's all that they had to say to that particular request. So the king's temper flares up, and in a rage, he threatens them with their lives. So these sorcerers had to confess that they were powerless to be able to tell the king the dream. They even went so far to say that there is no king that would ask such a thing of his subjects. But nevertheless, King Nebuchadnezzar ordered that all the wise men in the realm be destroyed. So Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, went out to slay the wise men of Babylon. Now, a few years previous of this, the king had conquered a place called Jerusalem. And he had taken many of the skilled people back with him to Babylon. And some of these men were Daniel and his three close friends. They were young men at the time, and they were enrolled into this elite school in Babylon. Now, any person in Babylon would, would have been privileged to be able to attend this school. <clears throat> But they had graduated at the top of their class. And they had recently been placed in the service of the king as part of the wise men. So Daniel and his three friends are considered part of these wise men. Now Daniel and his friends were true servants of God. And you can read about it in uh, Daniel chapter 1 of their faithfulness and consecration to the Lord both in temperance and also in the use of their mind and their mental powers and in their studies as well. But at this point in the middle of the night, they too were marked for death. Daniel, taking his life in his hands, ventured into the king's presence and begged that time be granted that he might petition his God to reveal him the dream and its interpretation. Now God is always faithful to his people. And Daniel and his three friends, they poured out their hearts to the Lord. Their life was in immediate danger. They had honored God in their life and God honored them as well. God revealed to Daniel the dream and the interpretation. Now, what was the first thing that Daniel did? He praised the God of heaven. He praised his name for giving him this interpretation. And so he went and he found the captain of the king's guard. And he was ushered again before the king. And so Daniel goes in in a calm demeanor in the presence of the world's greatest monarch. Filled with faith in his God as he stood before this king and he told him the king's matter. Verse 26 and 27. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, 
Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers shows unto the king. They cannot tell you the thing that you ask of them, O king. They have no power in them to do this. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. Nothing happens that God is not already aware of or is not already allowed. Now sometimes we might not understand everything that is going on in our world today and why, but we need to understand and remember that God is still sovereign. So Daniel tells the king his dream. And we're going to look at this at verse 31 and onward. Daniel 2, 31 and onward. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. It was magnificent. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest, sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken in pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote at the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof to the king. Now, what two objects did the king saw see in his dream? What did this king see? And we see this in verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. So he saw this great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. So he saw an image, but what else did he see? Verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and of clay and break them in pieces. <clears throat> so the first thing that the king saw was this great image made of the following mineral elements. So you might want to write this down. <clears throat> the head was of gold. The breast and arms were of silver. The belly and thighs were of brass. The legs were of iron. The feet of iron and clay. Now next the king saw a stone that had been cut without hands. And at this point, King Nebuchadnezzar was no doubt sitting on the edge of his throne, spellbound. Nebuchadnezzar knew that in fact this was the very dream that he had dreamed. And because that Daniel told him his dream with complete accuracy, he was ready to receive the interpretation. So what is the biblical interpretation of this dream? We're going to allow the Bible to tell us this. Daniel 2, 37 and 38. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them. Thou art this head of gold. The king was regarded as the head of the state. This is why Nebuchadnezzar represented Babylon, the empire that began the prophecy. Neo Babylon ruled the world from 612 to 539 BC as one of the mightiest empires in antiquity, one that could aptly be described as the head of gold. 
And notice that this prophecy begins in Daniel's time. So we understand that the kingdom of Babylon was represented by the head of gold. Now what else does this dream tell us? Verse 39 and 40. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, so it shall it break in pieces and bruise. Babylon's supremacy would not last forever. Succeeding kingdoms inferior to Babylon would rule in their turn. Just as silver is inferior to gold, so the kingdom that followed Babylon enjoyed diminished glory. Led by Cyrus in 539 BC, the Medo-Persian Empire conquered Babylon and reduced it to ruins. The Medes and the Persians were the ruling world power from 539 to 331 BC. And during their reign, this, this is interesting, during their reign, all taxes had to be paid in silver. Isn't that interesting? Praise the Lord. Now you can read about the overthrow of Babylon by the Medes and the Persians in Daniel chapter 5. But what was the next kingdom that was predicted? The kingdom of brass. What was that? The kingdom of brass was the kingdom of Greece. And it came into power when Alexander the Great conquered the Medes and the Persians at the Battle of Arabella in 331. Now I know that most of you have heard of Alexander the Great. Greek soldiers were called brazen coated. Very interesting. Because their army was armor, their armor was all bronze. And notice how each of the succeeding mineral depicted in the image is less valuable, yet more enduring than the one before it. So did another kingdom arise as prophesied in this dream? What was the kingdom of iron? The Iron Monarchy of Rome conquered the Greeks in 168 BC and enjoyed world supremacy until Rome was captured by the Ostrogoths in 476. So Rome had a very long tenure. Rome is the kingdom that dominated the world when Jesus Christ was born. And in fact, it was Rome that put Jesus Christ to death at the hands of the Jewish leaders. And notice how Daniel foretold of a thousand years of world history with unerring accuracy. The rise and fall of these four world empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, are clearly foretold in the Bible and proved by historical records. So praise the Lord for that. So the fourth kingdom was Rome, but there's something interesting about Rome this fourth kingdom that is t told us in Daniel chapter 2. So we're going to look at verse 40 and 42. 40 to 42. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Rome was a conquering force. They would even commit genocide I remember watching about uh, Julius Caesar. He was just a, a great uh, commander, military commander, a great commander. But it would break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with the miry clay, and as the toes and the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom should be partly strong and partly broken. This is some interesting history here. When the Roman Empire began to crumble in A.D. 476, it was not overtaken by another world power. Instead, barbarian tribes conquered the Roman Empire and divided it just as Daniel prophesied. Ten of these tribes involved into modern Europe. 
Now, who's heard of the ten divisions of Rome? Ten divisions of Rome. We're going to look at this. They were the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, Franks, Vandals, Alemanians, Suvis, Anglo-Saxons, Heruas, Lombards, and Burgundians. Some of them are still in existence today in Europe. Like, for example, the Anglo-Saxons were, are the English, the Franks, they became the French, and the Alamanians became Germans, and the Lombards became the Italians. Now, if you want to read a little bit more about this subject, you can read in Daniel chapter 7 about these ten horns that rose up out of Rome, and then there was another little horn that rose up. It was a blasphemous power. And it uprooted three of these. But that's not our subject for today. But I invite you to study this out for it's very interesting. Now we've seen these kingdoms come and go. And now we're on the last stages of these divided kingdoms of Europe. And also of the world as a whole. But there's one kingdom that was left to come. And this is my favorite part. Verse 44 and 45 and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. The king was convinced of the truth of the interpretation, and in humility and awe fell upon his face and worshiped, saying, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Dear friends, this king Nebuchadnezzar was convicted of the power of God and he, could, he had to but admit that he was king of kings and lord of lords. Have you been convicted of that yourself? Have you admitted that Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords? Just think about that, dear friends. Daniel's life and all the wise men were spared because of God's mercy and his mighty hand that he had worked through his servant Daniel. You see, in men's hearts, the rise and the fall of nations, the industry, the technology, the advancements in science and health, we attribute that to our power, to our cunning, to our brilliance. But dear friends, in the Bible, the curtain is pulled back and we can see that God is sovereign and he ruleth in the hearts and the minds of men. He sets up kingdoms and he tears them down. And this lesson Nebuchadnezzar needed to understand and it actually took him so many more years before he fully understood this. But the Lord kept working with him and he's merciful. And even though if you might have ran from the Lord, if you might have pushed him away all your life, he is merciful and he is seeking you. And if you are watching this right now, you can know of a certainty that Jesus Christ is calling you and his father is drawing you to himself. But do we believe this, dear friends? You see, when Jesus died long ago, he didn't set up this kingdom then. Oh, no. He set up the kingdom of grace in his heart, in our hearts. But this last kingdom, the kingdom which shall never be destroyed, shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and stand forever. It is still future. And that kingdom belongs to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is coming soon, dear friends. He's coming for his people and he's coming to take us home and his kingdom shall not pass away. And I would like for you to turn with me to Revelation 21 verses 1 through 4. 
And we're going to see this wonderful promise that the God of heaven has given to all that will fully surrender their hearts to him. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And that is a promise that we can claim right now, even in these perilous times that we are in. You know, the whole world is babbling, uh, battling with this COVID-19 Many are sick and they're dying. Many have had family members that have passed away. Much of us have been experienced to stay at home orders and been having a lot of times to ourselves. But I hope that people are starting to look at, at their lives. They're probably starting to wonder, what is life? What is death? Why is all this suffering in the world? And is there going to be an end to this? Oh yes, dear friends, there is. But Jesus Christ wants to save each and every one of us. He wants to give us a new life in Him. My dad was just telling me this morning about how that the chiefest of sinner out there is only just a prayer away of having a new life in Him. Dear friends, if you're discouraged, if you're wondering what is coming next in this world, if you're wondering about the financial and economic impact, if you're concerned about the health care workers and the society as you know, as you, as you see it crumble, oh, oh yes, this is very concerning. But God wants to save each and every one of you. He wants to forgive you for your sins. He wants to give you repentance. He wants to give you a new life in Him. And He wants to assure you that He is coming soon and He will take you with Him to heaven, to be with Him. And this message, the image and the stone, we can see how the God of heaven has prophesied, has foretold, all these events, these kingdoms succeeding all the way down to the end of time and that His kingdom will be the conquering kingdom. And I want to be part of that kingdom, dear friends. We can see from this vision that God is in control and He has a great plan for you and me. Recognizing that God is in full control of earthly events are you willing to let him have full control of your life? Is this your desire, dear friends? If it is, won't you just pray with me just now? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this great study of Daniel. And please do teach us. Please move upon our hearts. And thank you for helping me to be able to present this. Please do help everyone to understand the power and the might that you have and that you are mighty to save and you are seeking to save that which is lost. Oh, dear Lord, if there's any that are raising their hands to thee, crying to thee for forgiveness, for repentance, please give them that wonderful assurance that you've promised to each and every one of us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.